Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Saradeep Sarkar, your moderator of this session. Thank you for standing by and welcome to the webinar on Get a GDPR Ready. Data protection is about to get personal. I will introduce you now speaker for today. We have with us Mr. Karthik Sahani, who is a leader in integrated security from IBM India, South Asia, to talk about steps organizations are taking in their path to GDPR readiness and what can be done to prepare and solutions that can help organizations address these requirements, no matter where they are in their readiness journey. For the duration of presentation, all participants line will be in listen-only mode. We'll then have a Q&A session after the presentation. During the course of presentation, should you wish to ask any question, you may use the chat facility to send your questions to all panelists, and we'll try to address as much as we can during the Q&A session. I would like to now hand over the conference to our speaker for today, Mr. Karthik Sohani. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Good afternoon, and thank you for investing your time with us. General Data Protection Regulation, which takes effect from the 25th of May 2018, it requires that any business dealing with the European Union will need to comply with these new laws. So why is GDPR important, and especially for India? Any company that has its business in EU or deals with the EU needs to understand what GDPR is and prepare for it. Indian regulators are getting stricter and more stringent, and hence GDPR will be, be a precursor to that effect. An organization will, in its capacity as an assessor or an SSE or a consultant, need to either understand, practice, or prepare its customers for GDPR. This is a great opportunity to be able to expand your business with the EU, as well as get ready for the standards that will soon become regulation and mandatory compliance for India too. My colleague Adam Nelson has put together a deck which we will run through this afternoon. I'm sure there will be questions there, which either I or my colleague Sudeep will answer. And just in case we don't have the answers, we will get back to you with it. Sarabdeep, over to you to get the deck started. We can help you along the journey and also share with you our own internal um, IBM security um, and IBM experiences in GDPR readiness. So with that, I'm going to hand over the program to my colleague, Adam Nelson. Adam, take it away. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you all for joining. Uh, the GDPR is really going to fundamentally change the way all organizations manage their data coming out of Europe. It's very, very significant requires a significant change in the way data is governed, data is organ, data is managed. And we're seeing a lot of, a lot of our, our client partners really taking some serious steps towards addressing their GDPR needs. For example, um, with regards to funding, you know, there's been estimates from various organizations that GDPR will cost organizations anywhere from, 100, uh, from 10 to 100 billion euros to become compliant. Um, we've really seen an increase in spending in this area but there's still more that, more that can be done. So I'll touch on, on the regulation, a couple of high points. The first is, purpose of the regulation clearly is to create a new uniform, <clears throat> unified data protection regulation. There was a data protection directive, but the problem with the directive is it allowed all the member states in the EU a little, a little leeway in the way that they can address their data protection schemas. And GDPR does that as well. It does allow some, some changes based on, on location and jurisdiction, but not nearly as many as the Data Protection Directive. And it's good that it's a regulation, it's solid, um, and it'll help with compliance requirements. And it'll make things much easier for all, most organizations doing business in Europe or collecting data on EU or citizens or citizens passing through uh, the EU jurisdiction. It really enhances the level of data protection for EU data subjects. GDPR is far more restrictive than anything we've had in the past, and this is a good thing. Uh, this is you, you, data subjects know where the data is being used. They understand how the data is being managed, hopefully, um, and, how, and who is getting control of their data. And clearly to modernize the regulation. The directive is many, many years old, and the regulation has a, 
will officially uh, require compliance by May of next year. Next slide. So some of the key aspects are the May of 2018 date. We've seen a lot of our clients <laughs> moving towards that date. And, you know, it depends on jurisdiction and, and where they are. We see most of our financial services clients in Europe moving a little faster than our North American clients. Um, the North American um, companies are really trying to understand whether they are covered by GDPR and really what they need to do. They're, they're still learning about GDPR. Um, clearly has international reach. You do not have to be an EU company, based company, to be covered by GDPR. Um, most regulators have said they're going to take an expansive view of the regulation. So if you're not quite sure if you're covered, we recommend giving legal advice. Clearly, we cannot give legal advice at IBM, but we recommend that you reach out to outside counsel and ask them regarding your GDPR obligations. It's very, very important. And there are significant fines. I mean, we're talking 20 million euros or 4% of your annual turnover per incident. That could be very, very significant for companies. Um, and, you know, the regulators have also noted that they're going to start moving towards an, an enforcement actions probably pretty soon after May of 2018. Now, don't quote me on this. But I listened to some regulator discussions in, uh, at the IAPP conference, the International Association of Privacy Professional Conference, last April, and the regulators have indicated they're going to come after somebody quickly. And it's not necessarily going to be a Google or a Facebook. It's going to be kind of a smaller organization, or it's going to be a North American organization. But they want to make sure the GDPR has teeth. So they're going to try to prove that point fairly quickly. As I mentioned before, GDPR provides an enhanced level of protection for data subjects. You know, personal data, the, the definition of personal data has really dramatically expanded on what it was before. Um, <clears throat> you have to get consent for all your data use activities. That can be somewhat burdensome, especially if you have 20, 20 million data subjects. How do you get consent from everybody? Or what happens if you get consent from like 17 million of those 20 million? What do you do? The other 3 million, how do you manage that? It's a lot of issues in GDPR you have to start thinking about. Uh, <coughs> a right of erasure. So you'll have a right of erasure under GDPR, and you would think that would be relatively straightforward that you could go to a data controller and say, hey, erase all my data. Well, often data controllers push off the data to data processors, and those data processors will push those off to another data processor. So you have to understand where your data is and how to manage it. Because, um, you know, sometimes data controllers may not know who the second or third your data processor is. So we'll talk about TOMS and data processors in a little bit. But the data controller, data processor relationship is very, very important in GDPR. Something that your organization really should take a strong look at. Um, move on to the next slide. So the data controller and data processor. So the, the processor will work on behalf of the data controller. The data processor now has just as many obligations as the data controller and can be fined if they're not following the directions from the data controller. Now, the controller under GDPR will have to put together a list of technical and organizational measures. These are called TOMs. And they will provide these TOMs to the processor, and the processor needs to follow them uh, with regards to the data governance activities from the data from the data controller. But then the controller also will have to audit the, audit the processor We'll have to have a good relationship with the processor. We'll have to validate the processors doing what the controller asks them to do around the data. And if you have 20 million, I mean 20,000, 50,000 processors, this can be burdensome. Now, not all those processors are going to have protected data, but you need to find which ones do. So uh, data mapping should be an early part of your GDPR response planning. You have recent notification obligations also. I'm guessing most of your organizations have some form of breach notification, but now you have a 72-hour obligation to notify. So that's something else that you want to start thinking about and make sure those processes and procedures are very much in place and ready to go by May of next year. So what we've seen from talking to various organizations on GDPR, there's a whole list of activities that we kind of feel you should be moving towards. And you know this has been researched. Uh, with the regulators, it's been discussed with some of the thinkers in the GDPR space. And the items in red, all of these are important. The items in red are the areas we feel are just maybe a little bit more important. But this side and the next will touch on some of these points, such as, you know, an easy first step is to create a cross-functional GDPR team. It's not just the CPO, but it's representatives from uh, the privacy office, legal, compliance, 
IT, security. You know, it's going to depend on your organization, it's going to, you know, marketing. It's going to depend on, you know, what you do and how you manage data. It's very important to get that up and running. It should be up and running now. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. You know, know where your data is located. Know where it's shared. So start to get some data mapping and or data discovery done. Understand where your data is. Who owns the data? Where is it going? Is it transferred? Do you have the lead? legal obligations in place. Are you a member of Privacy Shield? Should you be a member of Privacy Shield? I know there's a lot of legal activities currently going on in Europe, which are going to start testing the validity of some of these areas, but those are not final yet. So our view is to still kind of move towards addressing your legal obligations through your privacy policies and statements. Once you finish your data mapping and your data discovery, you may discover new, new uses of, of your data that you didn't know about. So. Your privacy policy, at least my view, and this isn't everybody's view, but a privacy policy is the inward-facing view of your data protection activity. Privacy statement is what's on the website, the externally facing. So most organizations have one privacy policy, but they can have up to 25, 30 privacy statements. It just depends on which, which line of business does what with the data. When I've worked with organizations before, I mean, we've had you know, up to 30 different privacy statements. Now, they should tie together. I mean, the, the shell of the policies and the statements should tie together, but, you know, where, it's, where they're going to differ is the individual data use. You know, obviously, clearly, consent and choice, you're going to have to start thinking about how we're going to manage consent. Very, very significant. Document your privacy compliance activities on the next slide. I mean, it's very, it's, it's important to understand everything. GDPR wants you to document everything. You should have a GDPR roadmap, which talks about your compliance actions, and, you know, the GDPR playbook. So if a regulator comes to you, you can give them the playbook and say, here, here's your, here are our compliance activities. This is what we're doing for GDPR. You know, and you don't necessarily have to be completely done by May, although the regulators would like you to be. But if you have a roadmap, you're getting a lot of the projects out of the way, and you're going down a good path, you're going to be ahead of many, many organizations. In fact, I was speaking with a client a couple weeks ago, and I asked them, what are they doing with G about GDPR? And this gentleman said, well, we're just going to wait until the first enforcement action in June. I think that's a really bad idea, but I think you should really start thinking about this and start going in a good way. Um, train employees. A very, very easy way to address some GDPR obligations. Um, most organizations have security training. Some have privacy training. Some have both but it, just a, a training session to talk about protected data, data transfer, how do you manage data, is very, very key. You know, I know some organizations get pushback on training. Okay, so GDPR, let's go towards building your case around GDPR conformance and compliance. I mean, clearly privacy by design and security, data protection by design are also areas that you want to look into. And I've heard FTC attorneys mention that privacy by design is a mitigating factor for any enforcement action. Um, you really want to look at how you use data in the organization. Ideally, you'd set up a, you'd set up a program by which data use activities are tracked consistently. When a first project first starts, ask the project manager how are you using the data. A third of the way through the project, how are you using the data? At the end of the project, are you using the data like you said you were doing at the beginning of that project? Privacy by design, you want to make sure you wrap up privacy in your activities. Um, uh, some of my colleagues, not in my current organization, but were part of a project where they were $20 million into the project and realized they were not doing privacy by design and they had to rework the entire project. It was amazing. So it's some of those areas you definitely want to think about. Clearly, as we know, obtain executive sponsorship. Privacy works best the higher in the organization that it starts. Uh, so you want to start at the executive level. CPO level, the data protection office, officer level, as high as you can get. Just get support and you can kind of push these changes through. Next stop on the agenda is uh, IBM Security's approach to GDPR, and I will hand it back to my colleague Cindy. Great. Thank you, Adam. And um, as, as we go through, we'll, we'll do our best to share some of our uh, recent experiences. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is take you through a framework that we've been using both inside and outside IBM, and it really describes that journey, those five phases to readiness, and then within it, a very specific 
framework for IBM security, if you're a security practitioner, these are some of the obligations and um, activities you'll be wanting to think about. And I think it's important to emphasize the difference because um, if you're a security practitioner, the thing to, rec to remember here is that security is a major stakeholder at the table in, in GDPR readiness, and especially because security already is acting as a control point for data movement in the organization. It's acting as a control point for users. So it's perfectly positioned to be able to implement many of these measures to help us um, in, in our um, obligations. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be getting into that in more detail in a few minutes. What you're looking at on this slide is IBM's overall GDPR framework, which shows five phases to readiness. And it is designed to take those very complex 260-odd pages of regulations and boil them down into a simple series of phases, activities, steps, and outcomes. So let's start with assess. This is where you will want to understand where you are today with regard to privacy, governance, people, processes, data, and security. So really sweeping across your organization and understanding what are you doing today and what will you need to be doing and what's going to change. And that will help you develop a GDPR readiness roadmap. One thing to keep in mind is um, depending on your geography, you may be a little closer along that journey or even your industry. Industries like banking that are highly regulated tend to be a little bit closer along. So you really want to take a look at what are your current practices and how could you enhance that. Um, as Adam pointed out, the, the current data protection directive does have quite a bit of overlap with GDPR. So some of these obligations are already intrinsic to what you do if you are um, based in Europe. Now, if you are not based in Europe, um, as, as we now know, GDPR still applies to you. So if you collect data of individuals on European soil, uh, process it in any way, profile, et cetera, then um, you know, a lot of this may be new for you. As part of this assessment, you will also not only develop your readiness roadmap, but identify personal data. Does it mean you're going to identify everything that was ever created? Um, probably not. Um, if you are a hobbyist, for example, you may know where the high value items are in your house. Let's say you decided to give it all away and, or sell it on eBay because you're, um, you know, moving on to a new hobby. Well, you're going to know where your high value items are first. And you may not find every little trinket or every little tool you ever use, but certainly the high value ones or the ones you know where they are, or at least you um, know where the box is that has all that material. So it's the same with personal data. And we'll talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. But that in and of itself, creating a data map, is um, definitely um, a more detailed journey. From um, these activities, you will then create an assessment and roadmap. And that would be completing a readiness assessment. And Adam's going to talk more about that in a few minutes. You're going to identify your, um, your impact plan, your, your TOMS, your technical and organizational measures. And from there, you'll be positioned to design and transform your organizational uh, controls and practices. So that includes everything from training down to what business practices you will need to change. Um, and there could be quite a few when you think about some of the new obligations like data subject rights or the enhanced definitions for what is personal data. Um, that, that does require some pretty major changes. Um, in that process, you will work to create and define implementation plan. That includes your controls, your processes and solutions that you plan to implement. That will then um, put you in place to actually do your transformation and implement those new standards, such as privacy by design and security by design, new policies for data management. That could include archiving old data as an example. And then getting to operating and conforming. So having all your operational practices and processes now in place, being able to manage them, and then conform. And conformance is so important because for 
every one of those 99 articles, and if you ever forget how many there are, um, if you ever heard the song, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, you will never forget how many articles are in GDPR. It's 99. So for every one of those 99 articles, you will have to provide information, um, you know, some form of evidence, an audit trail to the regulator um, to show that you're meeting those obligations. It is not enough to say that you have a policy in place you will now have to prove that. So let's go a little further down into more detail and talk about how do we tie policy to practice. Now this is an area that I have increasingly noticed is a challenge out in, in our clients. And in particular, I see a lot of privacy um, organizations and um, also compliance organizations. They're well along in their journeys. They're well along in doing their assessments. A lot of times it's very manual, and they haven't necessarily communicated their working plans to IT quite yet. And that's really key. Um, here at IBM, our, our cross-functional work groups include everyone from our chief privacy officer, Christina Cabela, down to uh, hands-on practitioners who are advising on um, what tools make the most sense and, and you know, how we might implement those tools. And in terms of IBM's readiness journey, we've uh, published um, on our um, IBM uh, dot com slash GDPR landing page, a statement of readiness, as well as um, a host of information on our own program. So um, we're well along that readiness journey. And, um, you know, certainly uh, a lot of the tools that we're talking about today are tools that we're using in-house. So now, for you technical folks, let's talk about a functional reference architecture. If you um, have anything to do with GDPR and you're in IT, and if you haven't had discussions with your um, program managers, I highly encourage you to jump on in and um, get yourself involved because they are really looking for your help. A lot of them do not understand um, how many um, 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 automation tools are out there, how many services are out there to help. They don't necessarily understand the technical controls. So you all can be the experts to jump on in and help them with that. So in line with that, what we have created is a functional reference architecture that really describes some of the technical capabilities that are needed. And this is across um, all discipline areas, not just security. It could span into analytics. It could span into um, some of your operational practices, um, your customer-facing applications. And what you'll see on this chart is the following. Um, in the light blue sort of encapsulated boxes at the top, these are our overarching governance programs, our overarching program management, program governance for GDPR, privacy program governance, data subject rights management, because that really stands the organization. And the same for controller processor governance. So controller is the organization that decides the policies for the data collection and use, and uh, processors and potentially subprocessors um, will do some share of um, working with or, or managing that data, but they don't make the, the decisions. And within that, we have risk management because GDPR is all about risk. It is all about implementing controls and practices that are based on the risk to the data subject, not to the organization. It's to the data subject because GDPR, it's about privacy. So when you think about your program controls, think about risk, and as you create controls, you know, what levels of risk are there and then what controls are appropriate. The next sets of boxes are numbered for convenience. It doesn't mean anything in terms of, uh, you know, the order of implementation. So boxes one and two are around information governance and managing the processes and practices of, of data from retire, uh, requirements out to retirement, having a catalog of what is considered personal data, where that information is located, um, who the stakeholders are, how the information is handled. Um, you know, this is an area of flexibility. Now, if you are a smaller organization, you may not have all of these functional reference areas implemented formally. For you, a catalog may not necessarily be um, an information governance catalog. It could be um, something simpler. Maybe it's a portal that you have. So I do want to emphasize that based on, you know, what kind of company you are and what you do, that, that um, these elements could move around. Now, let's, um, 
let's talk about the, the rest of the layers. You'll see um, three through nine are very data focused. So um, data discovery, absolutely critical. If you don't have a map, you have no idea where you're going. Um, you know, I know some of us actually stop our cars and ask for directions when we get lost if our GPS isn't working. But um, for the most part, this is a practice that is really underscoring um, all the other activities. Archiving and disposal, thinking about when data is no longer needed, how do you get rid of it? Minimizing data where possible, managing the quality of it, and having a single subject view. So um, no matter who you are, if you're Henry Munns, Mickey Munns, Henry Michael Munns III, you might have five different names. You are one and only one person when it comes to data subject rights. Consent is very critical for GDPR. Explicit re consent is required. So you might need to think about how do you alter your consent practices and how do you implement and then data transfer and portability, the ability for an individual to request their information and to take it elsewhere. On the right side, and this is where we'll be focusing for the remainder of our time together, is identity and access management, security controls and monitoring. We're going to go into a lot of detail, audit and reporting, and then incident and breach response, which is so, so critical because we have that 72-hour window for reporting breaches. Now, something I want to point out, the 72-hour window is to notify the regulator. It is not the window for the data subject. For data subject, it is as soon as you know, possible, is not 72 hours. So sometimes that does get confused. It you know, doesn't mean you have endless amounts of time, but clearly to notify a regular is absolutely critical. Now we're going down to the next level, and we're going to talk about in more detail the IBM security framework which documents the key activities to address GDPR. You know, when we think about all the regulations and the obligations, it's pretty clear that um, they were written from a point of view of, of listing obligations and, um, you know, what is required to meet those obligations. Now, there's something missing. And if you're in security, you'll appreciate this. What's missing is the how. How do you get there? What is that list? What's that, you know, Magic list, and believe me, this is not a magic list, um, but it's certainly, um, I think of it as, as guidance. So, you know, what's, what's that guidance of activities? As a security practitioner, what do I need to do to get ready? And that is what the framework is all about, because the regulations do not tell you how. They tell you to implement controls according to the risk to the data subject. Now, that's great, because it gives you a lot of room to experiment with new technology, it gives you a lot of room to decide on how to implement, but at the same time, it's pretty specific about the obligations. So what, what is the framework? So the framework is a place where we take those five activities, remember the five phases, the assess, design, transform, operate, and conform, and we break them out and we describe the privacy requirements and the security requirements along the way. If you are a security practitioner and you're familiar with what a mature security program looks like, I have really good news for you. You're, you're halfway there. Um, if, if you've implemented a lot of security controls for your program, a lot of those controls can be repurposed and augmented to add and, and meet your obligations, or at least help meet them. So what you're going to see is on the right side of this chart is a list of security requirements. So if you look at prepare, assessing your current state, identifying gaps, benchmarking your maturity, establishing roadmaps, and identifying and mitigating vulnerabilities. Now, doesn't that all sound like a security program? Same with discovering. Discovering personal data assets is no different because when you're implementing security um, based according to risk, you do the same thing. What's different here is we're focused on personal data assets, not necessarily crown jewels. So what does that mean? Well, that is anything, virtually anything that identifies an individual. And I know you're probably all sitting there going, oh my goodness, um, you know, wow, that, that could be a lot. And it, it is a lot. Um, it could be an IP address, by the way. Um, you know, it could be some type of um, uh, mobile device identifier. So something that can identify an individual. Now. It's up to the organization to, you know, decide what those are. 
But the idea here is you're going to need to discover and classify, and we're going to talk about that in a couple minutes. Next is you'll create your remediation plan, your reference architecture, and I'm walking down the right side of this chart, and designing your technical and organizational measures, and that could be things like encryption, pseudonymization, access control, and monitoring. Next is protecting and implementing privacy-enhancing controls, such, again, could be encryption or tokenization, and implementing security controls. On the left side of the chart, you'll see privacy requirements. This is where it could be a little bit new for you if you haven't worked in privacy before. But again, um, a lot of this is about assessing against obligations and then designing processes, practices, as well as controls. So you'll see there's the assessment I discussed, the, dis the discovery and classification of personal data assets, creating your plan, designing your policies with uh, privacy by design in mind, transforming them, and then moving to the next slide where we um, get to operational state. So managing your programs, running your services, demonstrating you conforming, and being able to respond to and manage breaches. That's essentially it. So um, thinking about, especially in the conformance area, how are you going to demonstrate what you're doing? How are you going to, and I'm on um, the conform privacy, Record your personal data access audit trail. Record a data subject rights request. Run processor controller governance. And then, um, again, coordinate, respond to, and manage breaches. So now we're going to go the next level down and talk about some of the ways that IBM can help you in your journey and mapping against the GDPR framework. So how do you start that journey? Well, some common starting points for immediate action are um, conducting a GDPR readiness assessment, and Adam's going to cover that in a moment. Personal data discovery and mapping, I explained that that's very important. Uh, a quick moment on what that is. Data mapping is not data discovery. Data mapping is typically the process where you start high level. You interview stakeholders. You identify the major business processes, applications that are processing personal data, who are the stakeholders, where's the data processed, how is it used, um, et cetera. It's really uh, more of a macro level, and that is under Article 30 and something that the regulators um, expect you to be able to demonstrate. And then the data discovery and classification supports data mapping in that it does the actual how. Um, where's that information located? It can go out and search for it. You'll see that in a few moments when we talk about tooling, but um, that is certainly a place to start if you've already done an assessment, and then building a remediation plan. We're going to cover some of the lead offerings and lead ways that we can help you with GDPR in the next few slides, and Adam's going to um, talk in detail about the readiness assessment. We'll also talk about um, risk dashboards, um, the personal data discovery, um, how do you um, assess risks, especially access risks, track audit trails, a um, little bit on encryption, and then we'll wrap up with incident response. So Adam, if you would be so kind, take it away and cover the readiness assessment. <clears throat> Thank you, Cindy. So the first, uh, you know, we, we took a long, hard look on what would be one of the main, and not the only entry point, but one of the main entry points into GDPR and GDPR readiness. So we developed a GDPR readiness assessment, and what we did is we looked at all 99 articles of GDPR and evaluated them and kind of set them up in a kind of an extended roadmap in that we work with our clients to take them through each one of those articles. And from each article, for example, controller processor that we had mentioned earlier before, we taught, we understand, what, we work with the client, understand, tell me, what are you doing with your processors? How are you tracking your processors? And... Uh, we make the clients, we work with the clients, so the client illustrates to us, because you have to justify everything in GDPR, uh, how they're tracking their processors, how they are identifying their processors. From that, we assign a maturity ranking, and then from that, the next step is we work with the client organization to develop a next steps roadmap, which contains quick wins. So, for example, if you go through the maturity ranking and you come out as a one, for example, with consent, we can work with you. We have products and services that can work with you to move that from a one to a three. So we work, we work, the organization, work, work with the organization to kind of move up 
your maturity level when it's appropriate. Now, we know not everyone can get everything done all at once, but the results of the assessment really kind of self-build a, a GDPR roadmap. So should a regulator ask you, what are you doing, you, pro you provide the assessment or you provide the roadmap and they can see you thought this through, you've done some work on GDPR and you're going in a positive direction. For example, there's, there's the next slide is a picture of what the roadmap looks like. And the next one is the maturity model. So as I mentioned, for example, you know, for security, you're at a three here, but you want to be higher, you want to be at a four. And there is no standard level. Not everybody has to be the three. That's a nice area to shoot for. You're going to have some ones, you're going to have some fives. It's going to depend on your organization, your risk tolerance, and your focus. But if you're at a lower level, we work with you to bring it up. And it's, and it's shown to be very successful. This slide, the maturity model, we've been told is very easy for board members to understand. They get it very quickly and they understand where they are currently standing and where they need to go. The next step is a critical data protection program. And Cindy, I'll let you take the lead on this one. Absolutely. So critical data protection program is um, it, it's a, uh, a structured methodology that we have been actually using for quite a few years to help clients uncover what are their crown jewels in their organization. And by crown jewels, I mean their information assets. So this program adapts itself very readily to GDPR because what it's all about is understanding what is the most important data, where is it located, what are the risks, and how might we mitigate them. And this is a process I encourage you all to think about. Um, you know, certainly we can help you with it um, or, um, you know, to at least think about how you can implement this type of process. And it starts with understanding what is the personal data. And that means how do you define it and what are, um, you know, what's the taxonomy or the data model that you might want to use. We also have industry specific taxonomies for GDPR. So um, those are very helpful because they can help you jumpstart. We have a predefined taxonomy for personal data assets um, within our critical data protection program. Again, helps you jumpstart and, and get done um, a lot more quickly. Next is discovering. And this is all about automation and iterative discovery and analysis and classification. So much of this work is, um, you know, kind of rolling up your sleeves. It's like cleaning out your garage. You know, you're, you're going to um, look in a lot of places to figure out where all this is. But frankly, a lot of times you'll find false positives. So what we do is we identify the personal data. We scan your system, both structured and unstructured data, to help identify where's that information, including where is it located, what country is it located in. Because we know with GDPR there are some additional data uh, data residency uh, requirements depending if that you know where that data is processed if you are in a country with adequate data protection um, you know and that could be Canada Israel there's a handful of countries that are considered adequate for GDPR um, then um, you know you don't need additional data transfer agreements if you're in other places like US you might need to be a signatory for um, privacy shield um, um, or have other agreements in place. So that, that is very important and part of the process. Next is baselining what you um, currently have in terms of data protection, how you plan to implement it, and then once you um, implement it, how do you monitor and assess the risk? So you're probably wondering, well, that, you know, that sounds really interesting, but how do I track all of that? And um, that is what we call um, the iDNA dashboard, information DNA. Um, and this is a tool that's offered as part of the program. We are also going to be making it available um, late this year as um, a standalone offering, um, Data Risk Manager, which is going to be very exciting. And the way that iDNA works and why I think it's so useful is it, it provides an operational view of the risk of your information assets and that's what you see in the middle in kind of the shaded olive green and um, the, um, the blue boxes, and we're highlighting customer financial data there. So we have this operational view of the information assets, but it is tied to the business view, tied to the actual business processes. The dark gray boxes in this dashboard 
uh, will show things like what organization is involved with these assets, what organizational or business processes are involved. And then as I drill down into these information assets, I can understand where are they physically located. That's in the upper right. I even get a map of the country where that information is located. So this could be one or more databases or file systems that have that information. So, um, you know, if it's in Germany, you'd see a German map, et cetera. We, we haven't updated to show that, but that, I think that's very useful. An inventory of applications or inventory of data processors and controllers, um, the stakeholder view, and most importantly, in the upper right, you'll see this, is the risk. And the risk is based on um, two things, the vulnerabilities that we found and also the number of alerts. So um, that could be alerts based on individuals accessing that information or even security violations. And that has um, our data protection tooling underneath it called Guardium that's driving a lot of that information. We also use tools like Stored IQ for the unstructured data classification. Um, and I think, you know, it's a great way to bring together that operational and uh, business framework. Next is where's the personal data? who has access and why, and who accessed it. So these are really three legs of the stool. Um, not only just where's the data located, but um, you know what applications are processing it. So tools like AppScan can help create your application inventory. And to discover and classify personal data, we have uh, IBM Security Guardian Data Protection, and it's included GDPR Accelerator. That's going to help you with the discovery, and I'll talk about that more. And we talked about iDNA. And then who has access? One area that is really neglected, and especially with GDPR, is access management, access control. Understanding for each of the, your business processes, who has access to that information, and are they entitled to, and are there access risks? And with security identity governance, you can identify those risks at a business level, identify the information risk, and um, tie that together, and then take steps to mitigate. And then the last is who actually access the data, and that, again, is Guardium to help you with your audit trails. Let's talk about Guardium in more detail. This is all about finding personal data and tracking access. And the Guardian GDPR Accelerator has been out on the market almost a year now. We've had three versions out, and we're continuing to enhance it. The most recent version, we even have a quick start that gets your compliance set up literally in four steps. So the compliance monitoring classification can be done very quickly. A couple weeks ago, I did a webinar that talks all about it. I encourage you to go to look for Guardium Tech Talks, and uh, we will push out the link to the replay. But this is a predefined knowledge set that's mapped to um, many of the GDPR articles. Um, we have classifiers for many of the personal data types. So we look at um, uh, both the metadata and the data itself. We also have a full set of auditing and monitoring reports for data access, including data subject requests and personal data access, and that those can be automated into a workflow. We've created predefined policies and groups for collecting audit trails and for managing those audit trails, and then a full set of built-out reports and compliant workflows, compliance workflows to help you as well as um, any type of uh, vulnerabilities because you do need to understand your risks. So database level vulnerabilities are also included. And as I mentioned, this is part of the Guardian Data Protection License. If you go out on YouTube, there's a, a nice short 10 minute demo on the accelerator and we'll make sure we also push that link out to you. Next is how do you further meet GDPR Article 32 Security of Processing? One thing about um, GDPR that's very specific is um, that it, it describes two technical controls that helps with um, meeting compliance obligations. Those are encryption and pseudonymization. Pseudonymization is de-identifying information such that if you added something back to it, you could re-identify it. And encryption is, in fact, a form of pseudonymization. We um, think encryption is very important because if the data is um, stolen if for you know, any way or it's compromised and the keys are not, 
you may not have to disclose the breach to the data subject. That is in the GDPR regulations and it's um, known as a safe harbor. So um, that's something to think about because, um, you know, if you're really in a hurry to implement GDPR and you haven't done much of anything, implementing uh, uh, encryption is a very good way to put in a baseline level of uh, encryption uh, controls, rather. So um, I want to point out we have um, a, a very um, nice set of offerings. They're very broad. Uh, we have for on-premise Guardian data encryption that covers both databases, files, um, as well as big data, and it includes application level encryption, and it, and, um, it supports separation of duties, multi-platform, and um, what is new, we recently announced, and to me, having worked in encryption a long time, this is a big deal, is live data transformation. That means you can in encrypt your data while your systems are still up and running. You don't have to take an outage. If you have multi-terabyte databases or app systems with underlying files, that's a really big deal. Um, very low impact, transparent to both users and applications, and um, based on access control. So um, very straightforward to implement. We also recently added multi-cloud encryption. So if you are um, in a position where you have personal data on multiple cloud platforms, you know, it could be us, could be Amazon, Azure, et cetera, um, what multi-cloud encryption provides is the ability for you to own your keys, to keep your keys on premise with our security key lifecycle manager, and to have that data encrypted in the cloud and to be able to move it to move it from cloud to cloud without having to decrypt it. That's also a big deal. So I really encourage you to dig into that further if you're looking to implement um, some um, either baseline controls or enhance your controls. Following on the encryption discussion, we recently announced for System Z pervasive encryption as part of our Z14 launch. And again, this is a game changer. Um, what's a game changer about this is it is encryption um, all across the chain. It's transparent, it's low overhead, it, it applies to encrypting data in flight and at rest, and that includes full disk encryption, um, four times the amount of silicon on the chip that does the encryption, network level encryption, data and file set encryption, coupling security, and even a secure service container. So if you are working in the Z environment, I strongly encourage you to take a look at pervasive encryption because it is a great complement to the controls we've talked about today. Last but not least, before we go to the wrap-up and the Q&A, how do we meet that 72-hour breach notification requirement? Well, I can tell you, um, and this is really interesting, so a um, little side note. So we have um, what's called our cyber range in our um, uh, Cambridge um, IBM Security Headquarters. And this is a simulation environment where clients come in and they experience uh, a breach. And, you, and they typically will bring their entire team, all the major stakeholders, including um, potentially privacy officers, senior executives, et cetera, and we simulate an attack and a breach, including, um, you know, what the executives need to do to respond. And what we have discovered is that there, there is just as much attention that needs to be paid to what we call the, the, you know, to the right of the boom. The boom is when the breach goes public, to the right of the boom as to the left of the boom. And that means, you know, what do you do? How do you respond? Um, you know, how do you, um, uh, who do you call when all your systems are down? So what I want to point out is that um, when you think about breach response, using a tool like Resilient Incident Response Platform can be enormously helpful across the board because it does help you to improve that coordination, that information flow um, from, from the time that the breach, um, the incident is noticed um, to the time that it is um, you know, reported and managed and, and mitigated and resolved. So um, for GDPR, we recently announced a preparatory guide within Resilient 
a GDPR simulator within the, GD, the resilient privacy module and a GDPR enhanced privacy module that helps you with that um, um, guidance on you know, how, who to contact. And of course, as the regulations and, and the guidance um, you know, becomes more specific, that additional guidance will be added. But it will really help you in terms of defining the tasks that are needed to get ready and um, to make sure that you are uh, properly really following your procedures. So with that, um, we're going to have about 10 minutes left for questions, which is a wonderful thing. So um, the um, uh, final thing I'll leave you with is, you know, why IBM? So first of all, we have a, a very skilled IBM privacy consulting team, a dedicated set of privacy professionals with a very proven track record. We have also been in the privacy space for a very long time. IBM back in 2000 was the first corporation to appoint a chief privacy officer. So you know, inside IBM and um, outside IBM, we have been in the privacy um, business, if you will, a very long time. Um, you know, we're also very skilled in the area of security. And so that includes security services and um, our offerings, which we really have attuned to both privacy and security. And this is not GDPR washing. This is really thinking very clearly about you know, what specific capabilities we can add to our products to help you augment what you're already doing. So we have that broad view across all of our IBM offerings, whether it's security or analytics um, or Watson, um, to help you in your journey and to help you with that guidance and that expertise. And um, you know, certainly we've been out and about. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of our uh, uh, friends are on the uh, on the uh, webinar today, and um, we're just delighted to you know speak with you all one on one and share with you uh, some of the work we've been doing and also learn. More about what you're doing and how we can help you. So with that, we are going to, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Valerie to introduce. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, should you wish to ask any question, you may use the chat facility to send your questions to all panelists. So we already have a few questions on the chat. I would request Mr. Sahani to kindly take it forward. Um, hi, I have answered quite a few of the questions that came up. Um, there are some other questions um, which are there which I have not been able to answer, and um, I'm going to start calling them one by one. Uh, one of the questions that came up is how expensive is it to be able to be compliant, and um, the answer, the answer for that really is, what is involved in it, and that that's the whole reason of having this session, to figure out what exactly is required, to figure out what's the amount of quantum of work involved in getting to the GDPR standard, and that really differs for each organization and the kind of information that's going to be shared. So it is important, therefore, to figure out what, what are some of the tenants that one needs to uh, be able to work on, and um, the cost will vary from organization to organization, organization and case to case. A um, bunch of other questions that have uh, come up. Um, one is that, uh, will we get the presentation slides? Now I need to work this out with um, with the team and uh, try and arrange for uh, these slides to be shared um, with you. There, are, there is a level of confidentiality, but let's work around that. Um, have we got uh, Sudeep on the line? Sudeep, are you there? Yes, I'm there. This is Sudeep. Is Sudeep there on the line? There are a couple of questions that maybe I can follow to him. He can respond to it. No, uh, Mr. Sudeep is not there on the line. Okay. There was a whole bunch of questions. I'm not sure whether I'll be able to answer all of them. Uh, can I uh, sort of, is there a possibility of getting um, all these questions uh, and then responding back to the respondents because there's a 
<laughs> there's a whole lot of them and it's going to be difficult to go through all of them absolutely sir so there's a question that's again come and which is i think becoming a common question what are gdpr implications for telecom operators um are they generating a lot of personal data um similarly there's been a question on the retail industry so there've been a whole bunch of these questions that are coming up and to most of them it is not sector specific it is a process of how we are going to protect personal information and uh, the processes in, involved around it technologies that can do it for you uh, my other request would be because so many questions have come up we should have another follow up session on this webex and to to give your questions directly to us i'm going to call out a email id to which all the questions can be directed and then we will respond back to them um the address is bharti which is b h a r a t i dot sudhir s u d h i r at in dot ibm dot com i'm going to put this email out to all attendees right now I'll send that out if all the questions can be directed to this email id um i will be in a position to respond back to them this is sunny just want to repeat the email id that you have shared um uh, is it bharati.shadeer@in.ibm.com is that correct that's correct that's correct and uh mr sani should you want me to connect mr das as well if you could then i there are a couple of questions that i can call out to him and we can see if he can try and answer them absolutely so just let me a minute and i will connect it Mr. Sani, we have Mr. Das connected. Okay, so Deep, um, there's a question that's come up. If customer data of retail banking is accessed by outsourcing vendors outside EU for application production support, how does GDPR impact this? Right. So, uh, any kind of data which has been identified and discovered to contain privacy data, uh, privacy, uh, privacy related uh, you know, information, that will have to go through the process of assessment uh, that uh, GDPR requires. So, be it within EU, and of course, where there are the contracts, the you know, as, as in the webinar we heard, uh, US, Canada, a few of the countries where the contracts are already in place. there are no additional things would be required but for countries outside this uh, listed companies will have to work out the data contracts to ensure that both permanent as well as temporary transfer of data is following the com norms that has been laid down within the gdpr guidelines uh, most of them are related to encryption key management etc etc 
uh, but the contracts which are necessary to ensure the security of the data, which can be, uh, you know, one of the examples is that I sh need to be in a position to be able to unlearn myself, which means if I ask as an individual, uh, I want the data to be wiped off from the company, the company should be able to wipe that data off from their systems, right? Now, if the data is residing within an organization which is outside the EU boundaries and has implemented those capabilities, I'm just giving one example. It's not the only example. Uh, you know, I, the company should be able to wipe off the data from their storage systems. Uh, once you have all of these controls that GDPR uh, GD, and it has been certified, then yes, uh, you know, you will be able to utilize the data outside the EU boundaries. Um, Sudeep, another question has come from Mr. Seturaman. Uh, he's asked, please share the difference between HIPAA versus GDPR, since HIPAA talks about administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. Uh, HIPAA being a more US-driven uh, organization, so a lot of these privacy regulations across the world um, is there. GDPR is sector agnostic, and uh, whereas HIPAA is focused on the pharma and uh, the medical industry. Uh, having said that, is there much of a difference? Yes, there is uh, more of a control level differences. Uh, one of the key aspects that I, you know, I just mentioned on privacy, I can, you know, ask the organization to remove my data from their system. HIPAA may not have such a similar kind of control. Uh, HIPAA may not have very specific around which location you can store the data. GDPR might have that. The organizational structure that is mandated under GDPR may not be there. And the primary difference, I guess, uh, which concerns all of us is the 72-hour uh, deadline as well as the, uh, the fine that is associated with a violation when it comes to GDPR. So I would say GDPR is a more, uh, more enhanced, a more evolved version of data security in the very specific and very uh, tangible outcome that it wants to achieve. The next question is from Haim Pant, and I think it's pretty much on the same line. And the question says, if talk about data protection only, would PCI DSS not be worth doing? And I think it's pretty similar to yeah. this question on HIPAA, um, which is that PCI DSS is more specific, GDPR is more overarching, and um, hence, they both have their own spaces, and based on specific audit requirements, they'll both be required to be done. That's uh, correct, Patrick. Uh, moving on, uh, there's uh, another question that's come up. Why, what are the GDPR implications for telecom operators as they generate a lot of personal data? Um, I, I wouldn't say generate a lot of personal data, but uh, you know it, it involves a lot of personal data. Yes, so it is equally applicable for. Uh, in fact, GDPR talks a lot about location data points uh, and how do you store location data points? Because that's used by so many different organizations for new generation of uh, services like uh, you know telemarketing and all. They, they use that location data and telecommunication companies do have that data with them. So yes, from a data discovery, data identification map perspective, as well as the other part which we talked about, data mapping, uh, telecommunication companies do have a lot more data which falls in the ambit of privacy data. And so does pharma companies and so does finance companies. So each one of them has their own set of implications around private data and uh, each one of them will have to do their own work around it. Okay, uh, the next question came from Rajesh uh, Palshekarkar. Um, do we need to approach or the legal consultation or any specific consultancy who can help us to get GDPR compliance? And the answer Absolutely. is please get in touch with, uh, with us through the, through the email that we have sent. We can have a specific discussion around it. We can help you uh, with what you would need and uh, guide you in the right direction. 
Uh, so the way stand so stand that we have is uh, you know uh, we are the guides. We can IBM as IBM and we can guide you with the process. But legal counsel is definitely a must for any GDPR final uh, assessments. Yes, and we can help you with with getting in touch with the right people. Yes. Um, those are the questions that have come up so far. There was. Um, there was one last question that was there, which came up from Dhananjay Deco, which is standards such as NIST will also help? Question. Absolutely. Uh, NIST, PCI, ISO 27001, uh, COVID, these are all things that creates the framework. And GDPR is also about a framework uh, which with a little more uh, you know, uh, rigor. So yes, all of these guidelines will definitely help uh, organizations in the maturity curve towards GDPR compliance. So those, that are the last of the questions that are there uh, which got posted. Um, any other questions? There, we are more than happy to answer. Just send it to bhakti.sudhir at in.ibm.com. So, um, uh, I think with that, um, I think we've done with the questions that are there. Thank you very much, sir. Would you like to share any final closing comments for the audience? Uh, my uh, closing comment for the audience is that we should look at GDPR not as a deterrent, but as a big, big opportunity which is coming our way. Um, getting uh, access to private information and being able to process it and manage it outside the boundaries of EU used to be quite a difficult proposition. But now with GDPR and its framework, we will have access to it and be able to expand our business through the process. So we look at this at more from a uh, business expansion perspective rather than anything else. And if we have the right kind of advice and preparation, this could really help a company expand, specifically companies um, who have got manufacturing, BPO, back office operations, banking, all of them will benefit vastly with it. So with that, um, I'd like to close today's session. If we want to have a follow-up session, which is more in-depth and more in detail, happy to go through with it on another day and another time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sahani. I would like to thank all the panel members. Thank you, Mr. Das, and the participants who joined us today. Hope you all have spent a useful time. And with this, we conclude the webinar. Wish you all a great day ahead. You may all disconnect your lines now. Thank you very much once again.